Well, today will be our last week in this current Equipping Hour series. And as I prepare to wrap up this series today, I just want to start off by saying thank you to our elders for giving me the opportunity to teach what we've been going over the past several weeks. Uh, as many of you know so well, consecutive verse-by-verse -verse exposition of Scripture is uh, something that we cherish and prioritize at Grace Bible Church, and we wouldn't rather do anything else than verse-by-verse -verse exposition. And so it's not often that we take prolonged time to address current cultural issues from the pulpit, certainly not in the format that we've done it with this series, where six weeks uh, addressing a, an issue that we are very much still in the thick of and, and currently still surrounded by cultural upheaval about these things. It's not often that we do that. And I'm actually glad that that's not the case, that we don't do this with many things. It's a great testimony to the power and authority of God's word just consistently being preached and taught in the various ways that it is in this church from the pulpit on Sunday and in small groups and in the various ministries of our church. We haven't needed to address every single cultural issue that comes up because God's word has done its work in you and us. And so I'm thankful that... Uh, we haven't had to do series like this, and uh, still our church has demonstrated a tremendous capacity to discern the rise of various movements that are happening in the world and in the church, and here we are just doing the same old things that God has said work in his, in his church, in his people, uh, but this has been uh, just helpful for me and clarifying for me. I've received lots of encouraging feedback about ways that you've been built up and many of you have communicated a greater love for your Bible, uh, for God and the way that he has chosen to speak an increased resolve to know your Bibles and to put all of your hope in what God has said. And that is just thrilling for me and just makes me want to run harder and be more faithful and work harder to uh, understand and, and teach God's word. So thank you for that encouragement and thank you for being the kind of people who love God's word and in whom God's word is at work. This morning as I uh, close this series, I want to do so with an often and easily overlooked area of doctrine, and that is eschatology. Eschatology, the study of the last things or the end times. Our eschatology, what we believe about the future, matters greatly to our walk with God in general, and even when it comes to these issues in particular having to do with race and justice, what we believe about the future has a tremendous impact on how we approach these issues and is really instructive for how we should be thinking about these things. And so that is the area of doctrine that this morning has to uh, do with. I'm going to pray and then we'll, we'll jump into uh, our outline. God, thank you so much for revealing what you have about the future. Even that is proof that you want us to have clarity, that you want us to understand these things, and you intend them to increase our holiness, to cause us to glorify you, to make us marvel at your majesty and your exaltation to long to see 
the day when you are finally and fully visibly exalted on earth. We would be completely in the dark if it were up to us to guess at the things to come. And yet you have not left us in such a vulnerable position, but you have told us so that we might know and confidently walk forward today with everything you have planned for us, that we would spend our days currently longing for what you have said is sure to happen in the future, and that our lives would even be governed by those realities. And God, as we look at three future events this morning, I pray that you would do just that, that these events would take on a greater impact, uh, take on greater significance for us in the here and now, and it would make us more faithful to you in all the right ways, God. And we trust that because you long your glory, uh, long for your glory, that you are sure to ensure that, that these things will happen uh, and that these doctrines will take root in our heart for your own purposes. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Just a quick aside as we begin to discuss the future, as we begin to discuss what can easily be an overlooked category of doctrine, uh, eschatology does often get a bad rap from many who embark on its study because there are so many prevailing opinions, so many various interpretations of so many difficult passage, passages in Scripture that people are hesitant to embark on a study in future events with any degree of clarity or certainty that, that those things can even be had, clarity and certainty. And people upon reading God's word are reluctant to make any definitive statements because when you do, you've declared by default that others, brilliant men, uh, heroes in the faith often, are wrong about these very same events and passages and things that are going to happen in the future. The Christian, though, has no reason to be afraid of studying eschatology in his Bible. You have no more reason to lack clarity or certainty when it comes to the future than you do when it comes to the gospel. You can be as certain about what God has said about the future as you can about the gospel that you are dependent on for salvation. And the reason we know that, one reason we know that, besides the fact that the same God who clearly spoke the gospel spoke about future events, events that from our perspective are yet future. The reason we know this is because for the majority of human history, the gospel was eschatological. The gospel was spoken about in terms of the future. And so far be it from us to declare that the gospel is clearer than remaining future events because those things for most of the saints throughout human history were the same. They were believing eschatology when they were believing the gospel. Now we of course have the luxury of looking backwards at the gospel, at things that have already been fulfilled, and so we can see those things with clarity. But the saints of old did not have that luxury. And when they were believing the details of the gospel that Jesus, God himself, would take on human flesh and he would live a perfect life that none of us could possibly live and he would suffer under the judgment of God 
for sins that he didn't commit for those who would believe in him. And then before he decayed in the grave, he would resurrect and ascend back to heaven for a time before establishing his kingdom. Those details of the gospel, they were clear to Old Testament saints and they were all about the future. And so if God communicated clearly about the gospel, at least for most believers' experience, he was also communicating clearly about eschatology. And so as we talk about future events, we can embark on this study with confidence, not in our ability to gain clarity on our own, but confidence in the clarity and God's ability to actually speak. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at three eschatological realities highlighting God's future justice that have tremendous import for us today. Three eschatological realities highlighting God's future justice have tremendous import for us today. Those events that we're going to look at are the day of the Lord, the Bema Seat judgment, and the kingdom of God. Now, there are other future events. If you were just reading your Bible cover to cover, you would encounter other future events that will take place that would also and will also highlight God's justice. Most notably, the white throne judgment. Smed recently preached on that when we were in Romans 13. We looked at Revelation 20. When God judges all unbelievers, he resurrects them, gives them new bodies, perfectly fitted to endure his eternal judgment in the lake of fire. You should revisit that sermon as you have time. And so there are other events that we could mention, but these three will sufficiently arrest our attention this morning. First, the day of the Lord. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The day of the Lord. This is an event that is yet future from us, from our perspective, that will highlight God's justice. It's intended to highlight God's justice. And yet, before we get there, even today, this event has tremendous significance for us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting at verse 1, Paul tells the grieving, without hope Thessalonian church, Now, as to the times and epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come, just like a thief in the night. While they are saying, peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you also are doing. This event to which we're referring, about which we just read, this event is explicitly called the day of the Lord in verse 2. Do you see that in verse 2? For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come. This is a period of time that unbelievers, according to Paul in verse 3, he, he calls the unbelievers, they, them, they will not escape. They will not escape. And you'll just notice 
even in what we read, the change in pronouns. He is talking in verse 1 to you who have nothing, who have no need of anything to be written to you. Verse 2, you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come, etc. And then he changes pronouns talking about they and them and they. This is a part of a section which is actually a primary focus of, of why Paul is writing to the Thessalonians as he seeks to complete what is lacking in their faith. This is part of a larger section about eschatology and what's to come. And you know it's a part of a larger section because as we read in verse 11, there's a command that finishes uh, or completes this section. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another. The same command in chapter verse uh, chapter 4, verse 18 is given. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. We're not, we're not helped so much by the uh, New American Standard translation, but that's the same command being given. Uh, parakaleo, the imperative command to encourage or comfort. It's the same verb in Chapter 4, verse 18, therefore comfort, as well as in 5, 11, therefore encourage. I don't, I don't know who was uh, sleeping on their, their translation there, switching the words, but in the ESV, it's, it's carried over the same, encourage, encourage, comfort, comfort. In chapter 4, verse 13, and I'll just pick up reading here, here's what Paul is getting after before he gets to the day of the Lord. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. There's something that the Thessalonian church does not know. And he says we don't want you to be uninformed about that fact of what's to come. He's not talking about what they don't know when he gets to chapter 5, verse 1. Because he says when he, what he goes on to onto in chapter 5, they actually don't need anybody to tell them about. But in verse 13 of chapter 4, there is something they don't know. And the detail that they don't know is about those who are asleep. Those who are asleep. The reason Paul doesn't want them to be uninformed about those who are asleep, verse 13 says in chapter 4, is so that they will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. He wants to stop and prevent further hopeless grief happening in the Thessalonian church, specifically because there's something they don't know about those who are asleep, those who have died in Christ. So he goes on and says in verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so even God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Meaning, Jesus died and rose. God will do the same to those who have died, raise them with Jesus. For this we say to you by a word of the Lord, direct revelation from Jesus, this, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. There is the solution, Thessalonian church, to your hopeless grief. I'm going to solve this right now for you. You're grieving without hope for those who have fallen asleep in Christ. Here's what you need to know. They won't, or we won't precede them. They will precede us. They'll actually rise first before you. Verse 16, for the Lord himself, and here's why, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. 
comfort one another with these words. When Paul is recalling the catching up of those saints who have fallen asleep, as well as those who are alive and remain when Jesus comes to rescue his church from coming wrath. You'll notice this is all about what happens to believers in chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Not only ones who are alive and remain when Christ comes, but also those who have died prior to that event. And Paul is fixated on this event when Jesus comes to catch up the the saints with him in the air. This entire letter, chapter 1, verse 10, he reminds them, or reflects rather, that his teaching actually worked in the Thessalonian church in chapter 1, verse 10, when he says that you, you actually begin to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. That's a reference to the same event. Chapter 2, verse 19, For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. He's reflecting on the same event when Jesus comes to take the church. And then again in chapter 3, verse 13, so that he may establish, that is Christ may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father when? At the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And then even on until the end of the letter, in chapter 5, verse 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame when? Again, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That all-important event, specifically for the, the grieving Thessalonians, It's his focus at the end of chapter 4 as he expands on details that they were at that point unaware of. Namely, what happens to those who have died waiting on Jesus? Does their hope go unfulfilled? Do they miss the event they they had set their hope in to be rescued from coming wrath? And Paul's answer is no, they actually get rescued before you if Jesus comes while you're still alive. And that solves the hopeless grief of the Thessalonians. The day of the Lord, though, is a different subsequent event. And he reflects on that in the beginning of chapter 5. He moves on from all of the inclusive pronouns about we and us, and then makes a statement about them and they and them in verse 3 of chapter 5. This is a time that believers escape, but unbelievers do not escape. And he says that explicitly. They will not escape. This day is characterized by secrecy, according to verse 2. It comes like a thief in the night. This day is characterized by scoffing. According to verse 3 from the unbelievers, that is, it happens while they're saying peace and safety. That's actually a response to what the message of Paul and his companions and then the Thessalonian church was. What was their message? We saw it in chapter 1, verse 10. It's implied. Back up to verse 9, chapter 1. They themselves report about us, Paul says, when Silvanus and Timothy and I came and we had to leave because of the persecution. Now we're hearing what they report about us. That is, what kind of reception we had with you. And what was it? Well, you turned to God from idols 
to serve a living and true God. And not only to do that, but also to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who does what? Rescues us from the wrath to come. That was Paul's message. And that message began to sound forth from the Thessalonian church, according to chapter 1, verse 8. Wrath is coming, unbelieving world. Wrath is coming. Jesus is pouring out wrath on this world soon. You must flee the wrath to come. You must be saved from the wrath to come. That's Paul's message. It was his message when he was in Thessalonica. The Thessalonians, having believed what Paul brought to them, began to echo what Paul said. Wrath is coming. That's the word that was sounding forth from the Thessalonian church. And Paul reminds them what's true of people who don't respond to that message of repent, wrath is coming. What do they say? Not wrath, not destruction, peace, safety. We're safe. We're at peace. That's the scoffing that will be happening in response to their message. This day is also characterized by destruction, though. It's when they're saying these things in their scoffing that destruction comes upon them suddenly. So in addition to this day of the Lord being characterized by secrecy, scoffing, destruction, it is characterized by suddenness. They're caught off guard. It comes suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child. And finally, certainty. They will not escape. There is no escaping the day of the Lord for those who, when it comes, have refused to flee from the wrath to come. It's too late. No one experiences the coming day of the Lord who will be immune uh, to, it, to its destruction. And so this is a manifestation of God's justice on unbelievers. This eschatological reality highlights God's justice. And the Lord will justly pour out wrath on the sons of darkness in the day of the Lord. This is the very thing that believers are saved from, though, according to Paul in verse 4. But you, in contrast to those who will not escape the day of the Lord, the destruction that comes, you are not of the darkness, brethren, that the day would overtake you like a thief. Because you're all sons of light and sons of day. Again, in verses 8 through 10, he makes this statement that they would not experience the day of the Lord. Because verse 8 says, but since we are of the day, let us be sober, ha having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the helmet of salvation. That salvation is specifically pertaining to what Paul has been discussing in this context. Salvation, a word that could mean a variety of rescues or deliverances takes on the meaning of this particular context, and it is salvation from the day of the Lord. That is the hope of salvation referenced here in verse 8. For God has not destined us for wrath, that is, not wrath in hell, but coming wrath on earth. He has not destined us for that, but for obtaining, again, salvation through whom? None other than our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, awake when he comes, or asleep before he comes, died, having died before he comes, that this would be true. Jesus died so that we will live together with him. Jesus not only rescued believers from eternal, unending wrath forever in hell. He also rescued believers from the temporal coming day of the Lord wrath.
if you have set your hope on that rescue, then that, has, that implies some things for us today. If the day of the Lord is suddenly and certainly coming upon unbelievers, yet believers will be rescued from Jesus or by Jesus just prior to that coming day, then Paul actually draws out the implications helpfully for the Thessalonians. It's all in this book for us. Here's an implication. Chapter 3, verse 11, increase and abound in love. Increase and abound in love for the church and all people. He says in chapter 3, 11, now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Increasing and abounding in love for the church will not only prove that you are a disciple of Jesus, as we discussed last week, but will also result in Jesus establishing your hearts without blame and holiness with the rest of the saints before God when he comes, when Jesus finally comes. Have you connected your growth, maturity, and abounding love for the local church with the ability to stand confidently before God when Jesus comes? That's the intended effect of growth in love, of abounding in love, is that your confidence is commensurate with that growth when you stand before him. Another implication that Paul draws out in chapter 4 is to abstain from immorality in this present time. If Jesus is coming and bringing wrath after he rescues the church, then what should we do now? Well, we should avoid living like those for whom that wrath is coming. Chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the manner, in this manner, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. An avenger the Lord is. He is bringing wrath or coming to avenge himself on those who practice such things. Don't live like those people. Don't continue on living in such a way that may demonstrate that you actually belong to that group of people who will not escape God's coming wrath on the day of the Lord. As we read, comfort one another with these words. You should be comforting one another with these words. You're not destined for wrath. When wrath comes, on unbelievers, you'll escape it. You'll actually see the other believers who have fallen asleep in the Lord will all be caught up together with Jesus in the air before he unleashes wrath in a period of tribulation. Encourage one another with these words. Those are words of comfort. Sharpen your ability to be able to communicate these eschatological truths. And then it almost goes without saying, be like Paul in the Thessalonian church. We must be a church from whom the word of God sounds forth that is telling unbelievers, wrath is coming, flee the wrath to come by believing in Jesus, the one who died for that very purpose to rescue unbelievers from wrath. We must be evangelists in that sense, telling your neighbors, your unbelieving family members, your children who are unbelievers in your home, 
your coworkers. Wrath is coming. That must be our message. It's not enough for them to just look into our lives and see, wow, those are some nice people who keep their yard really tidy. I really appreciate that. That's not enough. They must hear from us. Wrath is coming. I'm so thankful I get to tell you how to escape that wrath to come. Let me tell you what God has done for sinners, for me, in rescuing us from wrath. That is what unbelievers must hear from us. Another eschatological reality that is coming that should impact how we live in the present is the Bema Seat Judgment. The Bema Seat Judgment. This is what Smed touched on as he preached Romans 14 in that section about liberties and how we must conduct ourselves with others, others in the body as we participate in Christian liberties, things that could possibly be a stumbling block to others, but that we have the freedom in Christ to enjoy to the glory of God. The Bema Seat Judgment is that judgment falling in between Christ's coming to rescue his church. It's after the rapture and before Christ's final coming when he brings his kingdom. This is when believers, specifically the church, will stand before Jesus to be rewarded for the works done in the flesh. This is also God's justice. And this fits perfectly with the definition that we've been talking about justice to grant or withhold what God deems appropriate according to the standard of his law. And this judgment takes place without reference. And in the passages where it's mentioned, Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this judgment takes place on the basis of works done in the flesh, personal works. Uh, this is irrespective of ethnicity, class, culture, family history, privileges, earned or unearned. Everyone gets judged based on the same standard of righteousness. Now, this kind of justice among anti race gurus in our day is actually being said is impossible or wrong to judge without reference to ethnicity or privilege, etc. Some are saying that it is right to take into account these various factors. Only if you're uh, oppressed do you have the clarity to rightly take into account these factors, of course. But to not take into account those varying factors is actually called unjust. To not give thought to privileges, to not give thought to disadvantages, and just to judge with the same standard of judgment. That's being called impossible, which is obviously a shot at God's justice, because that's the kind of justice he plans on exercising on this day among believers at the Bema Sea Judgment. And it's also the standard that God has told us to judge with. And so some are calling this impossible, this kind of unbiased uh, impartiality. But the Bema Sea judgment is a helpful reminder that justice has one objective standard. That standard actually is the judge himself, Christ. Um, he said in John 5, and in 27 that the Father has granted all authority to judge to him, to the Son. And so he is the standard. And he will exercise judgment by the only right plumb line given in his word. And this judgment actually has significant impact for how we think about what the church should be doing now 
in 1 Corinthians 3, specifically for ministry, as Paul talks about ministry labors, a motivation for rightly pursuing ministry work, for under, undertaking those endeavors with the right motivations and with the right attitude, Paul focuses on the Bema Sea judgment. In verse 5, starting in verse 5, 1 Corinthians 3, what then is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants, through whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Each will receive his reward according to his own labor. In God's economy, it is right to be rewarded based on labor. We're not talking about salvation. No one will be justified before the law on the basis of works done in righteousness. No one will be justified that way. But for those who have been saved by grace alone, apart from works, based on their faith, we're talking about Christians, they will be rewarded based on their labor. I recently listened to a podcast, uh, some woman who, She's supposed to be sort of the authority on uh, gender discrimination in the workplace. And because women are usually, as we know, burdened with tasks associated with the home and with raising a family in a way that men aren't, and they desire to take on those things, she suggested that gender equality or justice done in the workplace would have people promoted on the basis of something other than the quality of their work or the hours that they put in or their availability for clients. She said, You'll, a, a woman who's trying to raise a family will never make partner having to be tied to specific work hours. So justice would reward people based on other standards. That's the world's version of justice. God sees right, sees fit to reward people based on labor. And he goes on to say that it is how you build that matters. Your labors have to do with what kind of material you build on the foundation of Jesus Christ in the church. Verse 12, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. You could build with gold, silver, precious stones, things that survive and actually are purified when fire is set to them. Or you could embark upon ministry, what, what you're calling ministry, with unsuitable material like wood, hay, straw, stubble, things that get burned up when they're tested by fire. And I am certain that those seeking to add to Christ's church and build on the foundation, which is Christ, with critical race theory, with worldly ideologies, if they find themselves before Christ at the Bema Seed judgment, then they will be poor, having nothing that survived the fire 
because they built with poor materials. Promoting racial equality on worldly terms. Promoting racial justice through secular ideologies and pagan social experts. Those will be burned up, those labors and ministries. And certainly some of those men and women are actually damaging God's temple in their work by inputting into the body the very kind of division that the Corinthians are chastised for practicing. He says in verse 16, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy and that is what you are. This is where Paul takes the conversation surrounding the coming judgment of the church. So give thought to how you are building. Make your labors for Christ's church worthy of God's reward. In this sense, you are living for eternity. When you host friends in your home, do you intend your time to be spiritually beneficial? Do your conversations gravitate to those things that might be described as gold, silver, and precious stones? Or, more accurately, is your fellowship characterized by things that are wood, hand, straw, and don't contribute to the further edification and building up of the church? Are you laboring to meet the needs of the church when you gather on Sundays even? Making the edification of the body possible, ministries like next generation ministries, communion, serving communion, coffee table ministry, front lines, those things that actually facilitate the building up of the body and make it possible. Do you labor for those ends? Have you given careful consideration to the needs that are happening around you on Sunday mornings, you can show up and it looks like, man, this is a well-oiled machine. This thing just runs, not on its own. We need servants. When you think about small group, is it a small matter to you to miss small group? Oh, there's lots of people there. We're not even really a small group. We're a big group. And there are lots of people there to edify everybody else. They won't miss me. Think of those days during the week as an opportunity to add to this building that God is constructing, to labor alongside God to build the church, his temple, with gold, silver, precious stones in ways that are eternally significant. You may not feel that in the moment. There was no life-altering conversation I had at small group tonight. It's okay. They happen week after week without you realizing it. I don't know how many times Sarah Demarest has been quoted in our small group. In essence, we split. She's not in my small group anymore. She gets quoted all the time. She's made a lasting impact on the women and men in that group. A third and final eschatological reality highlighting God's future justice, which has tremendous import for us today, is the kingdom of God, the coming kingdom. And I wish we had more than 10 minutes to, to talk about this, but we do a great job of reflecting on heaven, on reflecting on a coming time when God will destroy this universe, create a new world, new heavens, new earth, streets of gold, no more tears, tree of life. We love singing about that. We love talking about that. We love encouraging one another with the reality of heaven in that way. And we should, because that is going to be a glorious day. And that there is much comfort and encouragement to be had in reflecting on that. 
But there's a glorious day coming before that time as well that we shouldn't forget. We shouldn't skip over. And that glorious day is the coming of the kingdom of God. Before we go to heaven, quote unquote, right? thinking of the eternal state, the way things will be one day for all of eternity. Before then, heaven will come to earth. Heaven will come to earth as God's kingdom descends here. And this is the, the, the time. If you, if you read carefully through your Old Testament, you would encounter lots of statements about earth and a good time to come on earth. That's because they're living and focusing on the kingdom to come. That is a kingdom that will have a starting point here when all of God's promises to give land and blessing to Abraham's descendants, a converted, regenerate, holy people, David's seed sitting on the throne, when all of that takes place, that has a fixed earthly commencement, and that kingdom that begins then sees no end. Jesus' kingdom, there will be no end to it, but it starts here. Go to Psalm 24. David longed to see this day when God's justice was exalted and highlighted at the start of his kingdom. The kingdom of God begins with a tremendous unparalleled display of God's justice. Psalm 24 captures that succinctly. Starting in verse 7, lift up your heads, O gates. Ah, back up to verse 1. I don't want to I want to do this justice. A, a psalm of David, the earth is Yahweh's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. He's done that. Verse 3, who may ascend into the hill of Yahweh? He owns everything. He's the sovereign Lord of creation. But what about this specific, all-important place that he has picked for himself on earth? Zion. Who may ascend that hill? And who may stand in his holy place? Verse 4 answers the question, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive, he shall receive a blessing from Yahweh and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob, Selah. Not only is Yahweh the, the, king, the king of glory, not only is the king of glory the sovereign Lord of creation, he is also the gracious God of seekers. Those who seek him are the recipients of his grace. They receive blessing and righteousness from him. And, verse 7 through 10, he is the coming king of war. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. As David reflects on this sovereign Lord of creation and this gracious God of seekers, he can't wait to see him. He can't wait for the day that he actually arrives, this king of glory. And so he says, get out of the way, gates of the city. Be lifted up, ancient doors. Verse 8, who is this king of glory? Yahweh, strong and mighty. Yahweh, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. 
Who is this king of glory? Yahweh of hosts or armies. It could be translated. Yahweh of armies. He is the king of glory. David is reflecting on a time when God himself will enter into the place that he has called his holy hill. Zion, Jerusalem, the gates will open, welcome him with open arms. How? As a conquering king of war. When Jesus returns to establish his kingdom, he will do away with all evildoers on earth as he proves he is just and exercises justice by obliterating unbelievers still alive at that time. And he will march back into the city he chose long ago for himself as a conquering king. You can write down Zechariah 14. His feet will touch down on the Mount of Olives. His feet, Yahweh's feet, will do that. And verse 9 in Zechariah 14 says that he will be king over all the earth. Limitless expansion, limitless dominion on earth, ruling from the city of Jerusalem, it says in Zechariah 14. And who has access to the city during that time? Saints, it is those who have clean hands and a pure heart, those who do not lift up their soul to falsehood and do not swear deceitfully. A succinct way of capturing that the king of justice and the kingdom where justice reigns belongs to those who practice justice, belongs to just people, people who are just on God's terms. So if you want to know whether or not you have access to God's kingdom, ask if you practice his version of justice. Those going after justice like the world miss this day. They, they don't understand God's justice. And this is what was looked forward to by Old Testament saints, by New Testament saints, after the apostles had been given a abbreviated, intensive seminary course by King Jesus after the resurrection for 40 days about the kingdom of God, according to Acts chapter 1, what they want to know, all right, is it now? Is it happening? Is it now that you're going to deliver the kingdom to Israel? And he says... Not for you to know. The Father's fixed that by his own authority, but it's not for you to know. And so it's incumbent on us to live as God has called us to until that day comes. Preach the gospel to unbelievers. Disciple nations. That's the mandate. Not Christianize the state. Not establish just institutions. That's not our calling. If it happens... As you convert your neighbors and those in authority, great. We can pray that just policies occur. As a Christian, you have the freedom to write your legislatures. But that's certainly not what God is after. He is after conversions, life change, the advance of the gospel, and we will certainly suffer until that kingdom comes, and then we will be vindicated when that day comes. And we can live for that day as strangers and pilgrims for a time. God, thank you for these amazing realities. There's such an encouragement to us as we reflect on the various phases of what you've laid out for the future. Where we lack clarity, you don't. And so encourage us, strengthen our hearts to labor all the more to gain clarity so that we can live as a holy, set-apart people who long to see you reign visibly, tangibly, 
and to see what perfect justice really looks like all over the world as Jesus reigns and ensures justice for all. Help us to see that day, to persevere now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.